Good morning, Church of New Life, family and friends of Church of New Life. Today is Sunday, May 17th, 2020, uh, week eight or nine, nine, I think it's something like nine weeks since we've been able to gather together corporately as a body of Christ for worship uh, because of the pandemic here in Connecticut. Hopefully we're heading toward um, reopening the elder. Uh, elders have been looking at different criteria and different uh, ways of what it would look like uh, when we are able to reopen and the state is slowly uh, moving toward that this week in particular. So uh, we're hopeful uh, for um, being able to gather together corporately at some point uh, in the near future. Um, so we welcome you uh, to this uh, service uh, via social media. We're going to be uh, celebrating this morning the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I'll open us with a word of prayer and then um, I'll read some scripture. So Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we could gather together with our church family and friends. Um, even though we're prohibited uh, from gathering together corporately and it's been unwise for us to gather together corporately. Uh, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather as we have been gathering these many weeks via social media. We just pray for your blessing on the people, uh, on your church, on uh, the family and friends of our church, on guests that watch this uh, message this morning. Maybe a family member or friend sent them the link. We pray for your blessing on them and on their families. And uh, some have had a difficult week last week. Some have had difficult weeks, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but the pandemic has uh, played a major part in um, affecting us in so many different ways. So we pray for your blessing on your people here this morning. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would grow in our understanding and our appreciation of you. We pray, Lord, for um, your spirit to just touch our hearts here this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And uh, the message will be focused mostly on John 3, 16, and then other scriptures related to that. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but it does not know where it comes from, where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel to not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I were to tell you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come into the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes into the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. 
couple of weeks ago, we had a message on John 3.3 3, uh, that says, Truly, I say to you, as one is born again, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And this morning, we're going to focus on verse 16. Um, years ago, many years ago, at baseball games and football games, there used to be somebody that would sit behind a plate or sit in the middle of the stadium uh, with a big sign, John 3.16, uh, the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the title again is Celebrating the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This verse, John 3.16, and we've been focusing the last few weeks on uh, the gospel, uh, its effect on believers and the gospel, its effect on unbelievers, not yet believers. And this verse... Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful verse as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the central idea, the central thought in this verse is that God provides eternal life for those who believe in his Son. And in providing eternal life for those who believe in his Son, we see the intensity of the gospel, the invitation of the gospel, and the intimacy of the gospel. So we'll begin with the intensity of the gospel. For God so loved the world. For God so, that word so, speaks of the intensity, the greatness of God's love, the magnitude of God's love, the intensity of God's love, that he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. God did something here as it relates to uh, the problem of sinful humanity, and he sent his son. Uh, to be the propitiation, to be the payment for the sins of his people. So what did God do here in this verse? God so loved the world. The word so speaks of the intensity, the greatness of God's love. It means like, in this way, or to this astounding degree, did God so love the world. C.S. Lewis said, on the whole, God's love for us is a much safer subject to think about than our love for him. For God so loved the world. The love of God here is limitless. It embraces all of humanity. Now the point here is not that all of the world is saved from their sin, because this verse is saying that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And prior to this, in Jesus' discussion with uh, Nicodemus, He's telling Nicodemus that in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you need a second birth. You need to be born again, born from above. If you've not seen that message, if you look on the YouTube link, you'll see it. It was probably a couple, three weeks ago. Um, it explains there the necessity of the second birth and why there needs to be a second birth uh, so people can enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven. So the point is not that he saves everyone. God so loves the world doesn't mean that everybody's saved. That's universalism. The scripture is clear that everybody will be saved. The scripture is clear that there is heaven for those who have believed and trusted in Jesus. That there is hell for those who do not know Jesus. And then last week, if somebody hadn't seen the message last week, um, I encourage you to check that out from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It speaks about how a person... Um, to know they have eternal life and salvation and forgiveness of sin. The point here with the intensity of the gospel, the point here with the intensity of God's love is that Jesus Christ is the only Savior to whom anyone in the world can turn for forgiveness of sin and have eternal life. Therefore, everyone is invited to embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So in providing, Jesus has provided eternal life for those who believe, and there's the intensity of the gospel there, the magnitude of the gospel there, he so loved the world. And then, there's the invitation of the gospel. For God so loved the world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him. What a beautiful word that is. That, that word, whoever, is a personal invitation to all people. A person must believe in Jesus in order to have eternal life. But what does that belief in Jesus mean? 
It's more than just believing intellectually in your mind that Jesus is the Savior of the world or that Jesus is God in human flesh. Although a person, in order to have biblical saving belief in Jesus, would have to believe that what the Bible says about who Jesus is, is true. He's the Son of God. He's born of a virgin. He died on the cross. He was resurrected from the grave. He is the only way to salvation. Again, Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one can be saved from their sin apart from me. Paul said it this way, For there is salvation in no other name under heaven granted by which a person may be saved. Paul said it this way, He is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he said, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, to the Jew first, and also the Gentile. So for in order to, and that word believe in the Bible is so critical because it means more than just intellectual belief in Jesus. But it does mean intellectual belief in Jesus. But it also means a belief that includes a personal trust in Jesus. So there's an intellectual belief, there's a, there's a personal trust in Jesus for salvation and forgiveness of not just the sins of the world, but not even the sins of the world, but for a person's individual sin. A person can believe intellectually about Jesus, but that's not enough to receive the gift of eternity. The Bible says in James 2.19, you believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So believing is an ongoing condition of the heart. Believing is placing a personal trust and faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And it is believing also entails a, a commitment to follow Jesus. The tense of the verbs make this clear. It doesn't say that whoever believed on him. It's written in the present tense. Whoever believes. It's a present tense with continuous action. Whoever believes in Jesus. So there's an intellectual belief. There's a, a personal trust and there's a, a commitment to follow Jesus, to follow in obedience to Jesus. You know, in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, John explains why the Gospel of John was written. Therefore, verse 30 of chapter 20, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe intellectual belief, personal trust, commitment to follow Jesus. That you may believe that, you, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, ongoing belief, continual belief, belief that demonstrates itself, demonstrates its allegiance to Jesus, believing Him, you may have eternal life. That whoever believes in Him has eternal life and shall not perish, the verse says. I watched this past week two, two, two loved ones, two family members, um, passed away. Um, not from the, the virus, but from some other illness. And they haven't ceased to exist. Either one of them haven't ceased to exist. That word perish there doesn't mean that we cease to exist. But the word perish there means it refers to a person whose final destination or room is hell, is eternal separation from Christ, which is a consequence for not knowing Jesus personally, to be excluded forever from fellowship with him. That's what it means to perish. Perish means being under the wrath of God, being under the judgment of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 5, says, But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So, shall not perish here means eternal separation from God. Can you imagine being under the wrath and judgment of God forever? No hope of pardon, no possibility of parole, no purgatory. So you see there's a contrast here in this verse between God's love and then God's wrath. And the contrast between eternal life with Jesus forever in paradise 
and eternal death, eternally being separated. Again, so perishing is not going out of existence. It's staying in existence forever uh, in the torment and eternal separation from God in what the Bible describes and calls hell. Matthew 13, verse 40 says, So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out, his, out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let them hear before it's too late. That there is eternal life with Christ. There is eternal separation and damnation from Christ in hell. And the difference between the two is believing. Believing in Jesus. A believing in Jesus. A trusting in Him. A commitment to Him. A desire to follow Him. Um, demonstrated by repentance and turning to Him for forgiveness of sin. So why are people perishing if they don't believe in Jesus? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why there's people that are perishing. Everybody has sinned and is in need of a Savior. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages that we earn, if we're employed, we receive a paycheck. The wages that we receive are for the work that we've done that week, or that's two weeks, or that month, whatever the time frame is. The Bible says the wages that we have earned and deserved because we've sinned and fall short of the glory of God is eternal death. But the gift of God to be received in faith through Jesus Christ and Christ alone is salvation and forgiveness of sin. So we see here not only the intensity of the gospel for God so loved, we see the invitation of the gospel. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Whoever will turn to him will not perish and be saved. And then lastly, in providing eternal life for those who believe, we see the intimacy, this intimacy of the gospel. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the intimacy of the gospel. Eternal life. Uh, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The words eternal life or in the present tense, it refers to an actual possession of the believer because of their relationship with Christ. And they have this relationship. They have this eternal life forever. It begins the moment that they've been saved, the moment that they have trusted in Christ, the moment they've experienced a second birth and have been born from above and been born again. They have eternal life. And then their life with Christ there is one of growing intimacy, of a relationship with Him. It's not a matter of just following religious rules and codes and do's and don'ts, but it's a living relationship that people have. That's why we, years ago, uh, the church is going through a couple of name changes, but uh, the third one was when we changed from uh, Middlebury Baptist Church to the Church of New Life. And we wanted people in the community to know and that you know we're not just in Middlebury and we're not just Baptist, although we are in Middlebury. And we are Baptist, but we want to people to know the uh, the new life and the eternal life that come only through Jesus Christ. And we emphasize here at our church, and you're invited. You know, when this uh, pandemic and lockdown uh, end, and if you've been watching some of these messages, a family member or friend is giving you the link, and you're you're living in this area, we'd love to have you come and visit with us once. Um, once the lockdown lifts and celebrate and worship with us and share with us how Jesus has been working in your life and uh, maybe the Lord has saved you recently uh, through watching some of these sermons or speaking to some family members and friends or maybe you want more of an up close and personal look at what goes on here 
you're, you're curious about it, something's touched your heart about it. Again, we focus on Jesus Christ in a relationship with Him. So that's the intimacy of the Gospel. So let's start thinking about how we apply this then. First of all, again, we got the, the intensity of the Gospel, the, the invitation of the Gospel, the intimacy of the Gospel. Have you believed in Jesus Christ and turned to Him for forgiveness of sin? Have you trusted in Him as your Lord and Savior? A great verse, I've made reference to this many occasions on that note, is John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. As many as received Christ as their Savior, as many as recognize that they've sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as many as understand and recognize that salvation is a gift to be received. Paul said, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Have you received Christ? Have you recognized your sin? Have you turned to him in repentance and faith? Jesus says, if you have, he gives you then the right to become children of God. And there's that word believe again, even to those who believe in his name, even to those who understand and recognize he's the savior of the world, even those who recognize intellectually that he's the only way to salvation, then they place their trust and faith in Christ to save them from their sin. Then there's a commitment to follow in obedience to Christ in Christ throughout their life. That's biblical belief. John says here, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And being born of God is what that message on the necessity of the second birth talked about. For unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. It's a necessity. Those who have received Christ and have trusted in him as their savior have been born not of the will of man, like their parents, you know, had this beautiful little baby, and um, no, but there's a second birth, born of God. Has that happened to you? Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, puts it this way. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Isaiah says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Have you believed and received Jesus? in Jesus for forgiveness of your sins? Or are you under the wrath of God? Are you under the wrath of God? Or have you passed from death to life? Spiritually speaking, have you passed from death to life? John chapter 3, verse 36. Here's that word again. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Are you under the wrath of God? Or have you believed in his Son? Have you trusted in him? Have you made a commitment to follow him? Have you turned to him in repentance and faith to be saved? Jesus said it like this in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, and hears the word of the day again, and believes him who sent me, has eternal life, and has not come unto judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Have you passed out of death into life? And have belief and trust in Jesus. For the believers in Christ, how is God inviting us to grow in our knowledge of His Son? How is the Lord inviting us to grow in our relationship with Him? Again, we have referenced all three of these verses last week. 2 Peter 3.18 says, but Grow, not what you can say, but grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul said, I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. Are you growing in intimacy? Remember, we said this is the intimacy of the gospel. Are you growing in intimacy in your relationship with the Lord? And of course, there's John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Do you have that relationship with him? John Piper said, Eternal life is personal, intimate knowing of God. It's not like an inoculation against the disease of death. 
that works unconsciously like a spiritual antibiotic. Great analogy for where we are today with this pandemic. I think as of this morning, it was like 85,000 people have died from the coronavirus in the United States. And rightfully so, they're looking for a vaccine, right? They're looking for medication that will be able to uh, deal with the, the virus. Well, eternal life with Jesus isn't like that. You get that one-time inoculation shot. Hopefully, you know, the vaccine will be a, a shot that will work. We know even with vaccines for the regular flu, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But the point here is that salvation is not like an inoculation shot that you get against the disease of death and then there's no ongoing relationship with Christ. There's no ongoing pursuit with Christ. It's not like, I used to say, it's not like your antivirus software that runs in the background on your computer. It's just there, you know. No, that's not what the gospel of how we're saved. That's not the saving, that's not the saved being saved. There's that relationship with God that we're growing in Christ. There's a hunger and a desire to know Him more. There's an intimacy and fellowship with Him. And there is a definite, we're still worshiping on Sundays like this, hopefully. We're still having Bible study with really the same people that we're going, being able to attend the Bible studies in person are still going to uh, the Bible study, whether it's on Facebook Live with, with uh, Brother John or on myself with old school technology on a, on a conference call. Uh, the same folks that were in those Bible studies in person are in those Bible studies now. Again, but hopefully there's an ever-increasing desire for God. And I think I said this last week, I do have the concern that with all, and I talked to a group of pastors this past week, and they were looking at, okay, how would we reopen, and what would reopening look like, and what's the state of your church, and how are things going, and you know, I expressed, and some others expressed, you know, concern, there's been so much social distancing. How will that affect us? Well, it'll either um, have the effect of uh, we'll, we'll be even further distance from each other even when we are able to come back, or are not being able to be together will have an effect that, well, there's a greater hunger and a greater passion and a greater desire and a greater longing for the Lord. And that's what we're hoping will happen. Lord willing. Jeremiah 9, 23 says, Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. The Lord delights in his people, knowing him. And let me add this final way of how we would apply this message of the, the eternal life that only comes through Jesus and the intensity of the gospel here and the invitation to the gospel and the intimacy of the gospel. If anything, the pandemic having us face you know, life and death and hopefully it has the effect that we have a greater sense of urgency to pray for the unsaved family members and friends. And to have a greater sense of ur urgency and intentionality, intentionally sharing the gospel with people, sharing the good news with people. Hopefully, that's the effect that this has because we never know when that last time may be where we'll be able to speak with the loved one. And sometimes it's too late, right? We don't want to ever feel like, oh, wow, it was too late. I should have said this. Today is the day of salvation. So we should be um, more diligent, more intentional in sharing your word and deed, the love of Jesus Christ with people. Foundational question here this morning. How has God invited me to respond to the eternal life that he has provided through his son? How has he invited me to respond? You know, in verses 14 and 15 of this gospel, it said these words, and I'm just going to make reference to this quickly. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes, and I pray that that word believes just rings through our ears throughout the days ahead.
ahead in the rest of the day today and the rest of the week. That whoever believes, that a person will ask themselves, do I believe in Jesus? Have I trusted in him for salvation and forgiveness of my sin? Have I turned to him in repentance and faith? Have I been saved? And if I have been saved, how am I demonstrating the fact that I believe in Jesus in this given present situation that I'm dealing with? So he mentions Moses and the serpent there in the wilderness, which is a direct reference to Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, where then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent, and it came and set it on a standard, and it came about that if a, if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. So what was lifted up on that pole? The serpent was sent there, and they were bitten by the snakes in the wilderness, the Israelites were, because of their complaining and because of their murmuring against God and because of their sin. So they were bitten by these snakes, and the snake on a, uh, on a standard, on a pole, became the emblem for being healed. And if you looked at the snake on the standard, on the stick, the person was healed. So you see that that's what that was all about there. And it was because of their rebellion and sin and disobedience to the Lord that the snakes were sent as a judgment, bit them, they were killed. And now, in looking at the snake, the people would come face to face with their sin and God's judgment and God's displeasure. And just as the Israelites had to turn their eyes to the raised serpent in order to be healed from the serpent's bite there, all people need to look to Christ for healing from the sting and death associated with sin. One of the problems with me being standing here and looking at this camera and just nobody else here, I can't show you that behind me, I think you see the bottom of the cross here, but behind me is the, is the, is the cross, which is the forever reminder, like the serpent on a standard, on a, st on a pole in the wilderness, was a reminder of their sin and they need to look to this standard to, to be saved. And when they looked at it, they had to remember their sins. This cross that's behind me that you can't really see is a reminder of what Jesus Christ came and did on that cross in dying for the sins of, our, of his people. And it was our sins, my sins, your sins, that placed him on that cross. That now whoever looks to Jesus and looks to that cross and has biblical belief and trust in him will be saved. The quote for the week came from Charles Spurgeon. He said it this way, I saw at once the way of salvation. Like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. I had been waiting to do 50 things. But when I heard that word look, what a charming word it seemed to me. Oh, I looked until I could almost have looked my eyes away. There and there alone, alone the cloud of darkness was rolled away, and in that moment I saw the sun. Spurgeon, on a snowy day, went to church, and the regular preacher wasn't able to be there. Some of you have heard this story before. And there was a man there in the pulpit, just doing the best that he could to share the gospel, to share the good news, and he read Isaiah 45, 21, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And he just proclaimed the gospel. And he kept saying literally, to Charles Spurgeon. Young man, you look miserable. Young man, look to Jesus Christ and be saved. Young woman, turn to Jesus Christ today and be saved. Someone watching this today that's not saved, that maybe is a religious person, hasn't placed their faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. Look to Jesus. Look to that cross. It was your sin that put him on that cross. It was my sin that put him on the cross. Those who turn to him in biblical belief and trust and repentance and crying out to him will be saved. So will you do that? Will you look to Jesus in repentance and faith to be saved? And to the church body, well, before I do that, let me pray. We're, we're, we're here at the end. We're here at the end. But if you wanted to ask Jesus Christ to save you from your sin, if you wanted to look to Jesus Christ to save you, you could pray, Lord Jesus, I have sinned and I have fallen short of your glory. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to receive the gift of God, 
in eternal life through Jesus Christ. I want what John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus, I turn to you in repentance and faith to save me of my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. And if that's your heart's desire, and you pray like that, speak to one of the people maybe they gave you the link to watch today, or send us a, a note on Facebook, or call our church office, or reach out to us via our email, and, uh, and tell us what the Lord has done in your life. And we would love to encourage you and help you in that way. And then for the church, again, because God so loved the world, and He gave His only begotten Son, and that we have been saved by Him, and because of the intensity of the gospel, and because of the intimacy of the gospel, and because of the imitation of the gospel, which we have received by faith, let's exhort, let's encourage one another in the faith. Let's be intentional in sharing that gospel, and sharing that good news with people, so that others may be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen.